Good morning and welcome to an Out of This World Monday. I am Lisa Lamb and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the President and CEO of the Lewis Center for Educational Research. Today is a milestone day at the Lewis Center. It is the first time that we have ever attempted to join our schools, the Academy for Academic Excellence in Apple Valley and Norton Science and Language Academy in San Bernardino together in a single learning event. This morning, we have 116 classrooms with approximately 2,500 students in grades transitional kindergarten through 12th grade and over 300 staff members tuning in live. Additionally, we are being joined by our amazing partners at NASA Space Communications and Navigation and JPL, our AAE and NSLA families, the Lewis Center Board of Directors, and many members of our communities. I welcome each and every one of you to our program today. Over the next hour, you, we will have an opportunity to watch as 10 of our students ask questions of astronaut Tom Marshburn, who is currently orbiting Earth on the International Space Station. And if that is not spectacular enough, we will then have the opportunity to zoom in live with retired astronaut Dan Tanney to learn more about life on the International Space Station and about his personal experiences working for NASA and traveling to space. Here at the Lewis Center, we are afforded some pretty amazing learning opportunities. However, there are not many students, or adults for that matter, who have an opportunity to talk to an astronaut in space or spend time with an astronaut who has been on three shuttle missions. Now it is time for us all to settle in, free ourselves from distraction or other work at hand, and enjoy the conversations we are about to have. And I hope we all end our heiress contact inspired and feeling like we too can make our dreams come true and maybe even contribute in big ways to increasing our understanding of the universe and life here on Earth. Now let's watch a video that shows how we incorporate STEM at AAE and NSLA and how we have been preparing for this monumental day. The Lewis Center for Educational Research is thrilled to take our studies of space science to the next level through our AERIS contact. The Lewis Center operates two award-winning charter schools, the Academy for Academic Excellence in Apple Valley and Norton Science and Language Academy in San Bernardino. Across the Lewis Center organization, we share a strong commitment to engaging students in real-world science at all grade levels and have had the honor of partnering with NASA JPL for more than 20 years through our Gabbert Radio Astronomy Program. Our students have been learning about robotics in space and collecting data for JPL scientists for many years. Now we have taken our own leap into human exploration and become part of the Artemis generation with our Artemis Pledge. Elementary and middle school students have participated in Space Academy after school and summer workshops which focus on engineering in various aspects of human and robotic space exploration. We believe that early STEM engagement is critical to fostering students' STEM identities so that as they go through their lives, they will continue to embrace a love of learning, inquiry, and discovery. It's all about learning how to solve problems and think critically. Leading up to the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars, TK through 12th grade classes participated in Gavert spacecraft tracking sessions and a mission to Mars virtual day camp. Students submitted questions to JPL for the live TV broadcast and one of our very own students had his questions answered by acting NASA Administrator Steve Jerzak immediately following the landing. Elementary students at both schools enjoy weekly hands-on STEM rotation classes. We focused on improving our science fair projects and in preparation for our AERIS contact are learning all about living, working, and conducting science in space, space communication, and amateur radio. STEM is a very hands-on thing. We do a lot of hands-on work to try to bring what it is that they're learning in the classroom to a more relatable and practical way of them engaging with it. And in that way, it seems a little bit more fun. In science from rotation, we're learning a lot of STEM stuff. We were doing a science experiment and it was getting loud in the classroom and the sound with um, the salt was making itself. And that was so cool. Yeah. We have these little uh, two balloons. Yeah, yeah, two balloons. And you yeah, put them on your ear, then yeah. the other like one is those like two. So that way when you're reading, you can hear So when yourself. you make, you can hear yourself, and it just connects to your ear. I learned science every minute. 
And I did that by making pancakes, by seeing, by making them, putting the ingredients together, and then watching them turn into pancakes. A mí lo que me gustó de mucho es eso, Karen, es que en mi clase, de mis maneras, aprendí más cómo las cosas reaccionaban a otras cosas, cómo, cómo afectaba el clima a las cosas, cómo reaccionaban los materiales con las otras. We are fortunate to provide these opportunities to our students at AAE and NSLA, and also to students all around the world through Gabbert. Our work with NASA SCAN and JPL has allowed us to learn about deep space communications by partnering with real NASA missions such as Juno, the spacecraft currently orbiting Jupiter. And today, with 116 classes tuning in, our students at both schools will get to ask questions of an astronaut on the International Space Station through ARIS, and then have additional follow-up with retired astronaut Dan Tanney who spent four months on the ISS and also flew on two shuttle missions. This extraordinary opportunity to connect with astronauts couldn't come at a better time. Just a few months ago, we were able to host the first Noche de las Estrellas event in the United States at our NSLA campus in partnership with NASA Ames and the Mexican Space Agency. This event brought our students, families, and community together for a night under the stars and an opportunity to participate in STEM activities supported by more than 20 partnering local agencies. And just two weeks ago, we had the privilege of activating our AAE Space Force Junior ROTC unit. Being selected as one of only 10 units in the nation, the only high school in California, the only charter school in the world to have a Space Force unit is an amazing honor. Today's event will only further our students' awareness of all the career opportunities that are open to them, whether that is joining the Space Force, working at JPL, or even becoming an astronaut themselves. It is so exciting to see our students fully engaged while preparing for our ARIS contact, and I am certain this will impact them for the rest of their lives. We want to thank everyone at ARIS who worked so hard to make today possible. You are helping us reach our mission of creating global citizens and helping our students reach for the stars. Hello everyone, I'm Frank Bauer and I'll be the, your amateur radio ops moderator for today's exciting contact with astronaut Tom Marshburn on the International Space Station, also known as ISS. My amateur radio call sign is KA3HGO. I'm the USA Executive Director and International Chair of ARIS, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. ARIS is an international program supported by amateur radio operators from around the world. Some member organizations of ARIS include the American Radio Relay League in the United States, the worldwide AMSAT, or Radio Amateur Satellite Corporations, and our space agency partners, which include the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, and Russia, Russia's Roscosmos. Through the help of ARIS, amateur radio volunteers, and the crew of the ISS, we hope to soon establish an amateur radio contact with the International Space Station as it flies more than 200 miles above the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour over the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. This contact will be performed using the ARIS Telebridge Network, a worldwide network of amateur radio satellite ground stations that enable students to talk to the astronauts on board the ISS. The amateur radio ground station that will establish contact with the ISS today is, has the call sign K6DUE and is located at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Ken McCoy, N3FZX will be the lead operator of the K6DUE Telebridge station today. Ken, tell us a little bit about the K6DUE station and how you'll handle today's contact with the ISS. Thank you. We are pleased uh, to be here today to help you with your ISS contact. Amateur radio station K6DUE is located on the top floor of a building at NASA's 
Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and we are just north of Washington, D.C. Today we have myself, Ken McCoy, call sign N3FZX, Bob McCown, call sign N3IYI, and Dave Taylor, call sign W8AAF, as the volunteer operators of the station. On the roof, we have a directional antenna high above the ground that will be pointed at the ISS as it passes directly over our location. The antenna is connected to a radio that is also connected to the phone line that we're using to talk to you. We use a computer running satellite tracking software to tell us where the ISS is. It steers the antenna to maintain a good, to maintain a good signal for the duration of the pass and it controls the radio to compensate for Doppler shifts. The operator here at K6DUE will control our radio's transmit and receive modes, while the astronaut controls the radio on the ISS. Only one station can talk at a time while the other listens. This is why it is very important to clearly say over so that we know when to switch the radio back to receive mode so you can hear the astronauts reply to your question. Just before the pass is to start and we get ready to call the ISS, we'll open the radio squelch and we'll hear some static sounds like this. You will hear some of the static until ISS answers our call. Once we have established contact, we will turn it over to the first student to ask their question. So we are now ready for the contact with the ISS. We wish you great success. Back to you. Over. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we are about uh, 16 minutes before what's called acquisition of signal or AOS. And so um, I want to continue uh, describing and uh, with some videos describing uh, what we're going to do today. For starters, our contact today is with astronaut Tom Marshburn. He has an amateur radio call sign too. His is KE3, KE5 HOC. And he'll be using the ISS amateur, uh, amateur radio call, uh, call sign NA1SS. So you're going to hear uh, Ken use the call sign NA1SS as part of this uh, uh, the interchange between the ground station and Tom Marshburn on orbit. Mm -hmm. So we have a short video courtesy of the American Radio Relay League or ARL, which explains how the upcoming amateur radio contact will be performed and the, how the contact is about to happen. So let's watch that video. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ruth. And my name is Chris. You must be pretty excited to talk directly with astronauts on the International Space Station today. While we're waiting for the space station to come over your portion of the sky, let's talk a little bit about how it's going to happen. Of course, Mission Control is in contact with astronauts all the time using a big radio with lots of fancy equipment. However, we're going to be using something very different today. We are going to use ham or amateur radio to talk directly to the International Space Station. When most people hear the word radio, they think of a music radio station. But it's so much more than that. Radio actually refers to the unseen energy that transmits all sorts of signals using electromagnetic waves. At first, people learn how to send signals like Morse code. And then they discover that you can send so much more like data, computer signals, and even TV. Maybe you don't realize it, but you use radio every day. Maybe you watched the TV this morning, or you texted your friends, or maybe even you check social media like Twitter or Instagram. Let's travel back to space for a minute. Since the beginning of the space age, humans have sent many spacecraft out into the universe. These range from the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth daily, and the Curiosity rover exploring Mars. We've even sent a long-distance messenger, the Voyager 1, who has traveled outside of our solar system. Whether it's capturing a great picture of a far-off galaxy or conducting experiments on the space station, 
radio has to do with all of these. And today, you're going to be using ham radio. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is ham radio? Amateur or ham radio is a service and a hobby where operators can talk with people around their neighborhoods, their cities, their country, and even around the world. Amateur radio operators require a radio license from the government. They're not that hard to get. I have one. My call sign is KM4LAO. And mine is KD8YVJ. Our call signs are a way of identifying who we are to other operators. This lets everyone know that we have the proper license to using the radios. As amateur radio operators, or hands as we are often called, we can talk with others about basically whatever we want, often science or some new radio gadget that we are interested in. Let's focus back to the space station and your contact today. Many of the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the space station are licensed ham radio operators. That's why your operators today can contact them. The people here, as well as the astronauts, are licensed to talk to each other, and you are allowed to talk over to their radio. For our conversation today, we'll need an amateur radio station on the ground, either in this location or somewhere else around the world. We'll also need a radio in the space station. NA1SS, NA1SS. Great. You can hear the calls coming. This is November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, the International Space Station, over. On the space station, the radio transceiver is connected to an amateur radio antenna mounted on the outside. One of these antennas will be used today during our contact. For our side of the contact, we need a good sized antenna, a signal amplifier, something to make our signal stronger, and a rotator for turning our antenna. We have to keep our antenna pointed right at the International Space Station. And remember, it's moving across the sky and fast. To aim the antenna properly, we need to track the path of the space station exactly. NASA uses complex systems to track the path of the space station and other orbiting objects. The satellite tracking program we are using works out a complicated set of mathematics to provide the orbital location of the space station moment by moment as it moves through space. This information is sent to the computer that controls the antenna rotator, which moves the antenna to follow the space station. Maybe some of you have seen or worked with robotics. That's pretty cool stuff. And just like you can program a robot where to go, what to do, and how to get there, you can also program a computer to tell an antenna how to track the space station across the sky. You know, it took a lot of planning to get this contact. Several weeks ago, the ARIS operations team had to figure out when the space station's orbit would pass over this location. Then, they had to talk with the planners at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew's time is pretty full, so they were able to find a time that could work for the crew members' schedules. Once they found times that would work both in space and here on the ground, the host organized this contact. And in just a few minutes, you'll be hearing and talking to the astronauts. Well, it's almost time for your contact. It will be exciting, so good luck with it! Okay, hope you all enjoyed that video. Let me uh, give you a status update. We're about 20 minutes before scheduled after original signal to the International Space Station. Right now, the International Space Station is over the South Pacific, uh, traveling from south to north uh, towards North America. It will be uh, touching the uh, Mexi uh, Mexico and the uh, Central America area in just, uh, just a couple of minutes, and then, of course, going up the uh, East Coast through Florida and up the East Coast to, uh, to Maryland. Okay, so you have just seen what an ARIS contact looks like from a student's perspective on the ground. Now we'll have a short video with astronaut Tim Peak, KG5BVI, that explains an ARIS contact from an astronaut's point of view on ISS. So let's watch that video. NA1SS, this is N2SJ, over. NA2SJ from NA1SS for Hi everyone, I'm Tim Peake and welcome aboard the International Space Station, where we're orbiting Earth 16 times every day. 
One of the most rewarding activities that some astronauts undertake on orbit is to talk to schools using the space station's ham radio. Now these are events that are planned by ARIS, which is a worldwide group of amateur radio volunteers who are dedicated to introducing young people and students to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now this is the equipment here in the Columbus Laboratory, which consists of a handheld radio, a headset, and we also have a ham video unit. Now as the International Space Station orbits above your location, a radio link is established between the ISS and your school. Now because we're traveling at nearly 18,000 miles per hour, which is an incredible 25 times the speed of sound, we usually get about nine or 10 minutes of good radio contact before losing the signal. So about five minutes before the scheduled start time of the contact, I come into the Columbus Laboratory and configure the radio so that I'm on the correct channel. And sometimes I'll set up the ham video too. Just before the predicted time, I begin to start calling the school using the standard amateur radio calling techniques. For example, if the call sign of your school was GB4 Fun, I would say Golf Bravo 4, Foxtrot Uniform November. This is Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra, listening and standing by. Now at your school, the radio operator will be listening for my call, but may also transmit and try to call me as well. You'll probably have a much more powerful transmitter on the ground than we have up here on board. So I'm likely to hear you before you hear me. Then, once we can hear each other, then comes the best bit, which is actually talking to the students and answering the questions. Once I've answered all the questions, we use the remaining time to say goodbye to each other and end the connection. I'll then spend a few minutes configuring the radio back into a rebroadcast mode and then I'll go back to my day job, which is, of course, doing science on board the International Space Station. ARIS is a brilliant opportunity for astronauts to talk to school pupils. It's really rewarding to hear how excited the students are when they're talking to somebody up here in space. And it's a true privilege to be able to inspire our next generation of scientists and engineers through amateur radio. Now that you've seen what a contact looks like from the ground side and what it looks like on board the ISS, now comes the most exciting part, your contact with astronaut Tom Marshburn on ISS. We are a little over five minutes away from acquisition of signal with the International Space Station. The International Space Station can now could now be seen from Mexico and Central America. It's wor working its way up through Texas and then Florida and then up the East Coast. So we are about, as I said, about five minutes uh, before the planned acquisition of signal. With the time for the uh, ISS contact quickly approaching, I wanna remind all to please mute your cell phones and be as quiet as possible when not asking astronaut Marshburn a question. Also, uh, before we get started, um, I wanted to remind everybody that what we're doing on ISS is an experiment. So we can never quite know the result and the, until the experiment is finished. And students, please don't forget to say over. For those benef those uh, to understand, over is important as as Ken uh, McCoy mentioned, because we need to switch between transmit and receive on the uh, on the radio system. So uh, Ken, um, relative to uh, K6DUE, did you all have any, um, with the weather we had over the weekend, for those that uh, are watching nationally and internationally, we had a big snowstorm in the on the East Coast, not as bad in Maryland, uh, or at least not in, in the Washington, D.C. area. But did you have to do anything to get the uh, station ready? Any ice you had to clear or anything like that? We were fortunate that we only had about uh, an inch, maybe two, of snow with the storm that came through 
uh, Friday night into Saturday morning, and after the, uh, the storm left, we had nothing but bright, sunny uh, weather, and it's pretty much melted away. So we didn't have to do anything, so we were very happy about that. Um, no, no ice on the antennas to worry about. We're in very good shape, and uh, we're seeing here that we have acquisition of signal in uh, just over three minutes. So we're, we're, we're getting, getting closer, closer here. Over. Okay. And uh, Ken, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, starting early for the contact uh, and start calling the contact uh, the station. You want to remind everybody what it sounds like when uh, when they hear the the uh, squelch uh, being opened up and why you do it. Yes. Uh, just before we call, we'll open the squelch. And you'll hear static sounds like this. That's with the squelch open, so that uh, we can make sure that we we hear the uh, the astronaut call back. Initially, their signal will be uh, on the weak side, and then as they rise above the horizon relative to us, their signal will increase in strength. Uh, that generally happens quite quickly, and once we confirm that we have a, a solid contact with ISS, we will then uh, turn communications over to the school. And uh, you won't hear that static again until the end of the pass when we reached loss of signal, or LOS, which happens approximately 10 minutes after the pass starts. Over. And Ken, from your, thank you, Ken. And from your perspective, how much time do we have left? We are showing one minute and 35 seconds until AOS, and we will plan to call early uh, just to make sure we maximize the amount of time that uh, the students can ask their questions. Over. Okay, and I see the students are getting ready. So um, the International Space Station will soon enter visual and radio range of the K6DUE Aris Ground Station in Maryland. So Ken, it's all yours at this point. Good luck, everyone. Over to you. Thank you. And yes. Thank you. And uh, we just wait to remember to uh, talk loudly into the microphone. And don't forget to say over. And we're showing AOS here in about 51 seconds or so. So we're going to start uh, calling here. Our antennas are now under computer control and being pointed towards the ISS. Here we go. NA1SS, NA1SS, here is K6 DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, here is K6 DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS. Here is K6DUE for a scheduled school contact. Over. <laughs> NA1SS. NA1SS. Here is K6DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. <laughs> NA1SS. NA1SS, here is K6DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. <laughs> NA1SS, NA1SS, here is K6DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, here is K6DUE for scheduled school contact. Over. <laughs> NA1SS, NA1SS, here is K6DUE for scheduled school contact. Over.
anyone SS? Anyone SS? From K60UE. Here for scheduled school contact. Over. Anyone SS? Anyone SS from K60UE for scheduled school contact. Over. Anyone SS? Anyone SS from K60 UE for scheduled school contact. Over. Anyone SS? Anyone SS from K60 UE for scheduled school contact. Over. Anyone SS from K60 UE? We're going to try the backup channel. Switching to backup channel 13, A6DUE QSY. Lewis Center, this is the International Space Station. How do you read? Uh, we copy you, uh, NA1SS from K6DUE. I'll copy us. Over. NA1SS from K6DUE. I'll copy. Over. Time again. Lewis Center, this is the International Space Station. How do you read? Anyone SS here is K60 Lee. Copy you on the backup channel. I'll copy us. Over. Lewis Center, this is K6 uh, DUE. How do you read? We copy Q5. I'll copy us. Over. Lewis Center, this is NA1SS. How do you read? NA1SS from K6DUE. How copy? Over. K6DUE, uh, NA1SS. How's your loud and clear? Help me. Loud and clear. Let's uh, we'll turn it over to the school. We'll go ahead with your questions. Over. I'm Mia. I'm in first grade. How do you celebrate holidays in space? Over. Hello, Mia. We celebrate the holidays in space in various ways. Sometimes we bring little gifts for each other up because we planned ahead. And we usually uh, celebrate around the table with a big meal. I'm Alejandra of third grade. What dangers do you face on the International Space Station? ¿Qué peligros se enfrentan en la Estación Espacial Nacional? Over. Hello, Alejandra. Uh, we have three big problems that could happen that we train for all the time, and that is if we get a hole in the uh, station and lose our air, if we uh, get some bad air because something leaked on the inside, and if there's a fire. Over. This is Eden. I'm in fifth grade. Does breathing feel different when you are on the space station, or does it feel about the same as breathing on Earth? Over. 
Hello, Eden. It feels just the same on Earth. We're at 14.7 PSI, just like on Earth. Over. This is Brianna, 5th grade. If Earth food has expiration dates, how does food in space stay in good condition for several months? Over. Hello, Brianna. It actually has to stay good for years because they have to pack it in various rockets that launch from various places around the world and then be stowed on board for months up here. And they do it with heating the food and sometimes they irradiate it. Over. This is Milan, 6th grade. What is the scariest thing that happened when you were in a spacecraft launching or landing on the ISS? Over. Hello, Milan. For me, it was doing a spacewalk when I had to almost jump from one part of the space station to the other. Over. This is Miguel, 7th grade. If there is a power outage on Earth, how will that affect you? Over. Hello, Miguel. That would affect us quite a bit because then Mission Control could lose power, and if Mission Control lose power, we would not be able to communicate with them. Over. This is, this is Antonio, 8th grade. How does it feel to be able to find new discoveries to help humanity? What are some of the most recent discoveries? Over. Hello, Antonio. It feels wonderful. It's uh, one of the best parts of exploration is just making these new discoveries here in our laboratory. Uh, some of the most recent discoveries is we're uh, discovering new chemicals. We're discovering how cells behave and how their genes change and finding new medicines. Over. This is Desiree, ninth grade. What precautions would be taken if a crewmate got sick? Over. Hello, Desiree. We have some medical kits to take care of most things uh, that happen. If it got very serious, we'd be talking to the doctors on the ground, and if we had to, we'd use our spaceship like an ambulance and come back to Earth. Over. Hello, this is Tyler Zaddy. Oh, sorry. This is Tyler from JRTC. What is one piece of training that has been the most useful to you? Over. All of the training, Tyler, is very essential to be up here. I think that the best is the EVA training. We have wonderful training resources on the ground for that. Over. Hello, this is Tony from JROTC. Mike Hopkins is currently the only Space Force astronaut, and he switched from United States Air Force to United States Space Force while aboard the ISS. Will there be any more Space Force astronauts, and how many? Over. Hello, Tony. I don't know the answer to that question. I imagine that there would be. Mike Hopkins will probably do a wonderful job, and I would like to think that we will continue that relationship over. This is Milan. How does living in space with artificial light, recycled air, and close quarters affect one's mental health? Over. It would be difficult, but they do a very good job of taking care of us and letting us talk to our families and it's a wonderful crew to work with, over. Do the stars look different from Earth? They, they do from Earth. Are they bigger? Are they clear? Are they more of them? Se ven diferente las estrellas en el espacio que en la Tierra hay muchas estrellas, over. Hello, Alejandra. They are brighter, they are clearer, and they do not twinkle. So there seems to, that there is many more of them up here. They are beautiful. Over. This is Eden. Does each person on the ISS have a specific role? What is your role and what is your day like on the ISS? Over. We have reached loss of signal. That is the end of the pass. Good job, everybody. Wow, we've just uh, all been a part of a phenomenal distance learning activity featuring the students from the Lewis Center for Educational Research speaking with astronaut Tom Marshburn on the International Space Station. Congratulations, all. You did a great job. So uh, one thing I do want to say is, uh, this, as I said before, this is an experiment. We never know what happens. Um, and uh, on behalf of the international volunteer teams of ARIS, including the radio amateur satellite corporations around the world, 
the radio American Radio Relay League, ARL, NASA, and the other sp sponsoring space agencies. This is Frank Bauer, image radio operator, KA3HDO, sending my greetings to all of you in traditional amateur radio terms. In other words, 73s, which means best wishes. So I want to turn the event back over to Lisa from the Lewis Center. Congratulations, Lisa. Congratulations, students. It was phenomenal. Thank you so much. That was such an exciting event, right, you guys? Yes. Thank you to astronaut Tom for taking time to answer our questions and to everybody behind the scenes who made this once in a lifetime event possible. So now we are ready to uh, transition to the next half of our program. And so if you are on Facebook Live, you're just gonna hang tight. But if you are one of our Lewis Center classrooms, you're going to go ahead and jump on the Zoom link that was emailed to you. And we are going to prepare to hear and learn a little bit more about life on the International Space Station from retired astronaut Dan Tanney. So to get us started, we're going to first start watching a video to tell us a little bit about uh, astronaut Tanney's um, career. Frank, fantastic, awesome, awesome.
the Zoom portion of this. I believe I'm uh, broadcasting. Is is that correct? Okay, great. And uh, I understand we've got oh a couple thousand uh, people uh, tuned in, uh, and I'm a little confused. Were they able to watch the uh, the 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 um, Aris Pass? Uh, okay, so maybe what I've got is a bit of a delay because it's still going on uh, at the end here. So, well, great. Well, my name is Dan Tani, and uh, I'm a friend of Tom Marshburn's, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, it's great to hear Tom's voice and uh, see him up on the space station. He was actually my doctor for a while. He's a medical doctor, uh, and uh, his specialty was um, uh, space medicine. And, uh, and so uh, he was what's called a flight surgeon for, for a while before he became uh, picked up to be an astronaut. And so uh, he was my doctor and we were thrilled when we could hire him uh, to be an astronaut. So uh, it's, it's great to hear him. He's, he's, a, he's a good friend, a really good guy. The, those who uh, got to see um, uh, or got to talk to him uh, really uh, would be privileged to be talking to, to such a great guy. Uh, I just want to say a few things, and then I want to answer as many questions as I can. So for you teachers, um, I think if your students have questions, I think you put them in the chat. We're going to see how many we can get through. Um, I know there's a lot of great questions out there and a lot of people, uh, but I just want to uh, touch on uh, one or two things. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, oh, if, I can, if you can enable my screen sharing, whoever the host is, I would appreciate that. I just want to show a few things. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, well, I just want to show you what I was looking at during the, uh, the pass, and I was watching the International Space Station. There's a website where you can see where the space station is right now, and according to my map, uh, they were going up, the, they were on this yellow path, and they were going up the east coast of the United States. Now they're past uh, Ireland. Now they're over uh, looks like Europe, probably France, and then they're going to come down and uh, go through Turkey and Saudi Arabia and then into the Indian Ocean. So we'll check on them later and see how far they've gone in the few minutes that we had, uh, uh, we talked to them. Um, I just want to tell you that I was also pleased to participate in uh, ARIS when I was up in uh, on the space station. Uh, we had a different radio when I was there. I was there 10 years ago, I guess, or 12 years ago. And uh, uh, we used a different radio, but uh, but we did get to do uh, contacts with uh, schools. And uh, I just want to remind you that um, we, we live on the International Space Station. It's going around the Earth. It's going almost 18,000 miles an hour. Uh, and if you find, you can go to a website and say, hey, I want to go see the International Space Station. And then uh, you can go up and uh, I go outside and take a look. It'll be right before sunrise, or right after sunset. You should really go take a look at it. It's really cool. Finally, I just want to let you know, I launched on the space shuttle, which we don't fly anymore. Um, but that's how I got up and back from space a couple times. It was a really exciting ride, and I'd be happy to talk about uh, any of that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop my share. If I can figure out how to do that. And then I want to take as many questions as we can. And uh, Eden, I saw you try to ask your question uh, to Tom. He probably heard you, but uh, it was just at the end of the pass. And so we probably didn't, uh, you, we probably, we obviously couldn't hear the response. But why don't you ask your question again and we'll uh, see if we can answer all the rest of the questions that were in the queue. This is Eden. Does each person on the ISS have a specific role? What is your role and what is your day like on the ISS over? Uh, well, so we kind of are, we want to be uh, generic astronauts on the space station, meaning we all have things that we're kind of better at, just like you in a team. And, uh, but we don't have, uh, and we, we have assigned roles, meaning you're the, you're the specialist on the robotic arm. You're the specialist <laughs> on, um, this on spacewalking, for instance, but we all want to be able to do it so that we can all uh, be part of the team. If 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 somebody doesn't uh, has a schedule conflict and can't do the spacewalk, we want to be able to have another person step in. So we try to train to be all equally competent in all the things that we need to do on the space station, uh, and we are assigned 
kind of you're the you're the lead for spacewalking, you're the lead for robotics or science, whatever. Uh, but we all want to be able to do the same thing. Um, and I, there was another part of your question. Um, oh, and our day is we work about 12 to 14 hours in the day. It's a long work day. Uh, but uh, but in that work day, we get to exercise for a couple hours. And of course, we have our meals. And and so uh, it's ev it's different every day, which is the exciting part. We do science. We do space. Talks, space, 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 space. Um, and we are given a schedule every day. Here's yeah, what you're here's supposed to be doing right now. And so uh, it's just easy. You just follow the schedule and tell you to do. This is Brianna. What do you do if the person guiding you from Earth loses connection? Over. Well, that's a great question, Brianna. It, you know, we have ground control, mission control in Houston, and there's also a mission control in Moscow, uh, always watching us, always talking to us. In fact, they can command and tell the space station to twist and turn a little bit and even move up and down a little bit. And so they are always uh, watching us and helping command what we're doing now. If we lose contact with them and and to do that we use, have a very complicated communication system um and so but it's very robust meaning it's very reliable it almost never goes goes uh, wrong but just in case it did or if there was a big power outage i heard a question about a power outage um we have all the capability to do all that ourselves on the space station we just have to follow the right procedure all of this is written down if we can't talk to the ground we should do this and this and this and this and so we have a procedure that lets us know exactly what to do and we can control the space station we can reestablish communication with the ground and so we are prepared to lose communication uh if that happens but of course we don't want it to happen and it rarely happens This is, this is Mia. What meal will you get first when you come back to Earth? Over. Hi, Mia. Uh, well, when I, so I was on the space station for four months and when I was getting ready to come back. They started asking me, what do you want to, you know, we can have your dinner ready for you. What would you like to have? And I told them what I'd really like to have. I'd like to have um, a, a steak dinner, steak dinner and French fries. But you know what? When I came home, uh, from space and it's a long day and I'm tired and when you come back to gravity your, your body feels different your fit, body feels you feel like you of course you feel heavy and so things just don't feel right in my stomach just was a little twisted around it just didn't feel so I came back and I wasn't hungry at all but they had made me a nice steak dinner with a baked potato and french fries and and I ate a little bit, but I was just wasn't that hungry. But um, I'd go for one now. But uh, but uh, that's what I asked for. That's what they gave me, and I just wasn't that hungry. This is Miguel. How did it affect you when you saw Earth from a different perspective while you were in the ISS? Over. Well, when uh, when I got to space and got to look at the Earth, the, what struck me was how beautiful. Our home planet is. I was so proud to be from this incredibly beautiful planet. And so that's what changed in me. I thought, you know what? I am so lucky to be from such a beautiful planet. You know, maybe there's life out there, but I'll bet they're not from a planet as beautiful as ours. And so um, really the shift in my brain was I am such a I'm so lucky and an honor to be a citizen of the planet Earth. And I wish everybody could feel the same way so that we could all feel more united as the as residents of Earth uh, rather than feeling separated by oceans or boundaries or whatever. This is Antonio. What has been the most surprising experience or feeling since you've launched? Over. Um well I boy, I loved uh, the floating around, of course, you, you're told or, you know, you understand you get to the space station, you're going to float around. You've seen all your friends do it. You've seen it in movies and everything. But it was so fun. It was more fun than I expected. it, And uh, I loved it every single day of my four months of my 120 days in space on my and when I lived on space station. I loved the floating every single day. So I thought it was, I was surprised at how much I really enjoyed the floating around. Oh, this is Desiree. What happens if a machine starts breaking down on the ISS? Over. 
Desiree, that's a great question. And it happens, well, all the time because the space station is a machine. And just like your car or your phone or whatever, it can break, it can go wrong. First of all, it's designed so that if something breaks, there's nothing really, really critical that will happen if, if something we can think about uh, breaks. So there is uh, there are uh, redundant or, or duplicate power sources and there's duplicate computers. And so if a computer breaks, the other computer can take it. Now, if something and so and if that happens, we have to fix the broken computer or the broken power channel, whatever we can do that inside or maybe we have to go out and do a spacewalk and do it outside. If something really big happens, uh, again, just like we have procedures, if we lose communications, if all the computers crash, we can uh, open a procedure and figure out how to rebuild the computer network from scratch. Uh, uh, so we feel confident that we know everything we need to do to fix whatever might break on the International Space Station. 